Tuesday show. We our, had to. Our co-host is the mogul himself. Good morning, Rob. And How I, are you? I'll call him the uh, mogul, but he is also Delegate Michael Hornby. In, in Sport uh, of the tie today, man. I got, I got meetings regalia. today. Man, that's you got to look the stuff. part. Power tie, yellow. I like that. Actually, all my polo shirts were dirty, so I had to wear the tie. <laughs> <laughs> so, if, if, if we're being really honest here. <laughs> Maybe toss a few in the laundry next time before you come in. Yeah. Yeah. So, hey, uh, set it up because we got a different Tuesday show today. It's going to run uh, through 10 o'clock, of course, but it's uh, going to be off the script for what we normally Yeah, so do. this started uh, about a month or so ago. I was ch chatting with uh, Clay Riley, and he was saying he was going to be up here for a meeting. I was like, well, you got to come on the show. Um, and he said, well, we sh I want a co-host. I was like, wow, let's, let's, let's pull this off. And then... He got a hold of the speaker, and the speaker said, I'll come up and do that. So we're going to have our guest today for the first segment, Speaker of the House, Roger Henshaw, and Clay R Delegate Clay Riley. And then uh, for the second half of the show, we're going to bring in Jason Barrett and uh, Senate President Craig Blair, and we'll do a roundtable kind of like the Friday show. I thought it would be fun to, since they made the drive, we'd give them all the time they need today. Tuesday version of the Friday show. I like With it. not so old people. Let's. <laughs> that's a let's, shot at Mr. Stubblefield. Think, yeah, and Carl. Carl's <laughs> yeah. up there, too. Hey, let's say good morning to the Speaker of the House, Roger Hanshaw. Roger, good morning to you. Hi, Rob, good morning. Glad to be here. Great to have you in studio. Sure. Good to be back. Yeah, this is nice. And uh, Clay Riley is also the <clears throat> caucus chairman. Good morning, Clay. Good morning, Rob. Just one correction. Mike said I want you to ho host Not Clay said I wanted to co-host. <laughs> oh, so, I thought you were pulling just, a power move on Hornby there. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. That wasn't the case. But the, glad to it's be probably here, right. Rob, and be in studio. Well, it's great to have you guys here, too. How long was your drive, Clay? Uh, actually, uh, it's about two hours and 15 minutes. Um, I'm over here for work. We have an office in Berkeley and Martinsburg. Right. And there's a regional council meeting, Association of Regional Councils, and, and they're over here. So, Okay. And, Raj, how, how about you for the drive? Well, it's about an hour longer than it's supposed to be. Last night, DOH was putting everyone off onto 522 at the, at the 6870 exit at literally every vehicle. Wow. So I don't know what was going on there last night. I came back that way uh, two Sundays ago, and there's a construction project there. So uh, they, ha they were doing it right where 68 joined 70, and I guess that's not done yet. N not as of eight hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> we came back from Camp Dawson yesterday, and we didn't have any <clears throat> construction or anything else. It was a beautiful drive. Hit or miss. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I think that the Department of Highways in any particular state just has a surplus of orange and white barrels, and they just they don't have any more room for them, so they put them out on a highway and shut down a lane. Well, I've got to give them credit. That road has been worked on now for the better part of a year, and they're really making progress. Um, I, I think it's gotten much, much better, especially through uh, Clarksburg. Um, mm -hmm. They've been working on those bridges. So at least the money that we've allocated is actually working and, and going somewhere. Well, that's a good thing. Yeah. So uh, with this opportunity in the first half hour, we wanted to concentrate on the House here. And as Mike said, we'll bring in members of the Senate, Senate President Blair and Senator Barrett. And everybody will stay together here from the show from 830 until 10. But in this uh, first 20 minutes, let's focus on some of the House uh, issues that are going on right now. And Roger, the first thing that we and we'll get this as a greater issue, I think, at 830 uh, between then and 10, probably, too. But uh, the governor's tax cut the trigger and you're going to get together in august and try to hash a lot of this stuff out so when do you meet in august well the the, the already published interim meetings for august are august 25 26 and 27 rob mm -hmm. normally when the governor calls a, a, a special session of the legislature we ask him and he always complies to to coincide those with our existing interim schedule so we aren't bringing people to charleston twice right. that's no big deal for me i i i live in clay which is 30 minutes from charleston but if you live here that's a big deal so if if it's if it happens i expect it'll happen august 25th 6th and 7th explain the formality of the difference of an interim session versus a special session and what you can discuss in one versus the other and who sets the agenda? Yeah, that's a really good question, Rob, because our legislature is a part-time body, right? Members are elected to the legislature for, for a 60-day a session every year. That's what we call our regular plenary session. And during those 60 days from the second Wednesday of January to the second Saturday of March, we can consider whatever we want. Members can introduce bills on any subject. We can take up topics that are of our choosing and do whatever we want to with them. 
that's not true when the governor calls a special session. And under our Constitution, we're limited to what the governor puts on that special session call. So mm -hmm. things that he believes are sufficiently important and that need to be solved before we're together again in regular session, he puts on a special session call. And those are the things that we can do when he has a, 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 a what we call a special session. Now, if you contrast that yet again with what we call our interim meeting. So once a month, about once a month, we meet for somewhere between two and three days to just study things, to just hear reports from agencies, to, to hear witnesses from across West Virginia who show up to talk to us about things that are important in their community. Mm -hmm. And there's no votes taken. There are no, there are no no decisions made. That's a process of getting ready for the next regular session. Is, so, that when, is that when policy is crafted? Often, often. So much of the work that goes into the regular session of the legislature happens in the months leading up to it. So uh, I, I, I say to citizens often that by the time <coughs> January gets here and by the time the regular legislative session convenes, mm -hmm. a lot of key decisions have largely been made, perhaps not finalized, but the, the the train is well down the track by the time the regular session starts. So how much do you have, or do you and your leadership team have uh, conversations with the Senate and with the governor's office for these uh, special sessions? Is, is there a lot of work going in, a lot of negotiation beforehand, or is this the governor's idea and we take it or leave it? Well, as you know, we don't have them often, so okay. we, uh, we, we'll, we have somewhere between one and two a year, and, and Governor Justice has held with that. I don't like them. I don't like to have special session. I believe it, it incentivizes hasty decision-making a lot of the time, and, and we've all three been there. You all hear people, n not necessarily our colleagues, but the public, press on, well, can you do this in special session? Well, right. probably not, right. because there's a reason why we're supposed to just meet 60 days a year. But in terms of how we work with the governor's office and with the Senate, uh, the Senate president and I typically meet at least once a week during the course of the year. So we're, we're both in the building at some point during, during each week. And normally we'd meet at least once a week. We'd very often meet with the governor's staff around that same level of frequency. Uh, but in terms of planning for a special session, when we think one's coming, the the frequency of conversation and the frequency of meetings picks up a lot because we don't we don't want to be there a long time right. right we want to get in and get out and get it finished and in the end is is it really it's the governor's call what's actually on the the session that it, he could put one two three ten if he wanted to he, he can and has okay yes so if you have a special session that's going on during an interim session does that give you more freedom to discuss other things not really. So they, they would happen in, in parallel, Rob. So we, we would meet for whatever period of meetings are necessary to do the business that the governor has on the special session call. Mm -hmm. But then we'd also, in the background, have, right. our, have our ongoing interim meetings because it's, th those things are actually important. So the policy that gets crafted during those those intervening nine to ten months become things that we take up and consider in the regular session. So we don't want to shortchange them. But as a body you can only discuss and pass things that are on the governor's agenda for the special that's session. That's correct. Right? That's correct. You know, one of the things I think, and it's an important point there that Roger made is, I think that the best legislation I've seen, and I've only been there four years, comes from those interim meetings. When you have time to deliberate it, take the testimony, really understand how it impacts agencies, how it impacts the public, you know, sort of a hearing on, on the bill. Um, I, I think those tend to be the best pieces of policy that I've seen come out. They're the most well thought out for sure. Clay, what, what is the difference between what the caucus chairman does versus what the speaker does or the House majority leader? Uh, a whole lot less, I can tell you that. Um, no, so my responsibility is a lot in the communication of what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, you know, sort of what's on the agenda. No, so if it's during a session, uh, you know, what's on the agenda on the upcoming day, kind of briefing the, the caucus of where we are. Um, also helping with the whip to take a pulse of, you know, just where the caucus is heading and the group's heading of, of where they stand on a policy. So my real f role and function is really assisting the communication and getting that information out to all the members. Because it's hard. There's 89 of us. So, you know, when, when we're trying to have a special session or what's going to be on a special session or getting communication because a vacuum leads to negative thoughts. So trying to get that information out and communicate with everyone. Who's, who's disliked less 
in regards to the position that they hold. Who's the no person in the house? So, so Roger doesn't have to be the bad guy all the time. Who's the who's the lieutenant bad guy in your in your group there? Vernon right? Chris. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be. Finance chair. Right? Yes. I think yeah, the the two finance uh, the chair and vice chair definitely the no people. And then and then Hardy got to be the uh, the minister of uh, bad news. Yes. I guess most of the time, right? Yeah, I thought you know Doctor we, no. we had a long friendship, and John you know ruined my dreams the first <laughs> first session I was there, but he did it very nicely. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, when regards now to the governor's tax cut uh, request, so you're going to find out what the trigger number is when. So well, go, I was going to say we we know what the the trigger number is. It's going to be a four percent. It will be four. When did you learn that? Um, we I think they've announced it, you know, publicly uh, on the radios or I mean in, in press, press release. Yeah. So I kept hearing between three and four, so it's it is four. It is four. It is four. Okay, and then the governor wants another five. Now, I, I've interviewed numerous delegates and senators about this pay rate, or this uh, tax cut, and I get conflicting information as to what's possible and what's not possible. C any clarification on the House side as to how workable the four plus another five is? Well, everything is a matter of priority, Rob. So everything we do in the capitalism is a matter of balancing priorities, right? So is it possible? Sure. If, if you're willing, if we're willing, the state's willing to absorb the necessary financial decisions that, that are required to get us there. Mm -hmm. So any, anything's possible. So the question is, what are the priorities we want to balance here? So the governor is very clear that he thinks that would be a driver of population growth. He's said that for a couple of years now. Every time we've taken up a discussion about tax reform, he views it from the lens of population growth and mm -hmm. drivers of population to West Virginia. And there's, there's some data that bear that out. So if you look at other states that don't have a personal income tax, there is some data that suggests a net inward migration over time to those jurisdictions. Sure, we share that view too. We want to we want to have a, a thriving a thriving population center here in West Virginia. For a lot of us, though, we want to continue to make sure we're also making appropriate investments in infrastructure. I know that that's a that's a priority at the very top of the list for me because that also drives economic growth and, and really quality mm -hmm. of life for many of our West Virginians. And, and we've, we've put off a lot of investments in needed infrastructure over decades because we just weren't in a position to do it. We are in a position to do it now. So making that balancing of investment just one-time investment decisions versus putting more money back in people's pockets ahead of the schedule we've already adopted. That, that's the, that's the decision-making process. So is it possible? Sure, anything's possible. Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, uh, bankrate.com released a study of the top 10 places to retire in America. Top 10 states. Delaware was number one, and West Virginia was number two. I don't know if West Virginia is rated in the past – anywhere near as highly in a positive category like that. Usually when you hear about West Virginia ranking number one in something, it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing, Not sure. a good thing. This would appear to be a very good thing. Uh, your opinion on what might have uh, gotten the attention of Bankrate.com in terms of the criteria that they used uh, and why West Virginia might be a better place to retire now than it was, say, 10 years ago? I think there's been a number of policies that we've implemented over the past number of years. Um, specifically, let's talk about you know 21.25 percent personal income tax reduction, elimination of tax on Social Security income. So there we, you go. There's the there, there's, there's the winner. That and was, we're we're in the second year of that, correct? We're in the, Clay? Uh, we we're cleared it out this year. We cleared it out completely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you know that makes a big difference mm -hmm. and the quality of life and living here i mean we've made a lot of personal investments from the state or investments from the state and upgrading our state parks making sure that we're telling the story the way we want to tell it not the way other people want to tell it and i think people are recognizing it and i think that you've seen the policies you've seen you know us telling the story and i think that's what's made that change your pension check goes a lot further here rob so if you've retired from a a reasonably well-paying job on K Street in Washington, D.C. or on Wall Street in New York City, your pension dollars go a lot further in West Virginia than they go in Manhattan or in Washington, D.C. What is it, about 17 percent cheaper, I think I saw in that article, that to live here than mm -hmm. the national average? Mm -hmm. The decision to get rid of the Social Security income tax 
uh, the state income tax on Social Security income is a big one for seniors. Uh, my wife's parents moved from Wheeling to Pennsylvania uh, maybe 10 years ago or so because Pennsylvania didn't tax their Social Security and West Virginia did. Well, they should come back. Yeah, so, <laughs> so that's that's something that might drive people back or keep them from leaving in the first place. We hope so. It, it's 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 seldom ever a silver bullet. I mean, the the policy positions and policy problems we take up are seldom ever solved by one single decision. Because if they were if they were easily solved and mm-hmm. easy, if if they were solved by making just a single decision, odds are somebody would have made it before now. Yeah. The, the things that we're trying to solve now are, are multifaceted, are complicated, are things that re- reach out into several parts of society all at once. So it, it's seldom ever just a single decision. So switching uh, gears here, obviously the Eastern Panhandle uh, has been very well represented down within the House. Um, and a lot of those people have chosen either not to come back or they chose to run farther. How does that affect the Eastern Panhandle, how does that affect your leadership style moving forward, knowing that you've lost a lot of key leaders that have helped you during your experience? We certainly have, and, and certainly we owe a, we owe a big debt of thanks to all the, uh, the, the folks who have long tenures in the House, people who were there providing leadership to our caucus and then to our House before I was even elected to the House. So uh, among the three of us, I guess I've been there the longest. Before I was a member of the body, Representatives and delegates here from the Eastern Panhandle were, were carrying the flag for conservative policies that really mattered to a lot of West Virginians in the legislature, and we, we, we thank those folks for their service who are leaving us this year. But it it, it goes on, right? The, the legislature goes on, and it doesn't stop because any one of us leave. So we have, we have plenty of talent in the body. I'm not at all concerned about our ability to govern on a going forward basis. It does, however, shape the way we think about what our leadership structure looks like because we all always strive for some measure of geographic balance, of ideological balance, of experiential balance, and all all that goes into the decisions that that we have to make about who chairs committees, about who leads work groups, about who fills any of the responsibilities that we have to do to run the business of the House. So it'll, it'll change, but it'll change mostly because of the personalities and experience of the people who are departing, not necessarily where they've represented. And Clay, as caucus chair, do you uh, do you try and meet some of the new delegates that that are elected or around the state? Because obviously, those personalities are you have to communicate with. How do you handle that on a on a yearly yearly or, or bi yearly? Well, this rate? is my uh, first election uh, right? as the caucus chair, but yeah, no, absolutely. So I've spent a lot of time over this past summer calling candidates, even in the primary, just to let them know who we were check on them see how they were doing but um, since the election since the primary yeah I've been reaching out I've been out to meet some of the candidates and and for the general election because when they come in we want to make sure they come in effective they come in quickly they come in comfortable they you know it's easy to throw them into the deep end but we really want to make sure that they're swimming because we're going to come in in February and we're going to have a lot of work to do right right so you're going to have about 25 to 28 new members Mm -hmm. And so uh, you were a freshman this past session. Yep. So coming in, having that a little bit of foundation from some of the experienced people that you knew really helps you get up to speed and helps you, I mean, do the work of the House. Yeah, absolutely. We I, need them. They're elected. People right? like John Hardy, Espinosa, householder, definitely helped me get used to the process because it, it takes, there's a learning curve there. And with 30 new Delegates every session, I think, is, is about right. Yeah. And and we have to make sure people realize, Mike, that, that you and you were there. Yeah. You, you were there just just less than two years ago. When you're elected to the body, you're coming into an ongoing working operation, right? right? Yeah. So when you, when you're elected and you become a delegate, there are still others there who have been working on policies for sometimes years before you got there. Yes. So figuring out what's been done and why it's been done really matters. So part of what we have to do is make sure people have everything that they need in order to understand what's been done and why so that they have a a proper context for what we're working on right now. So a lot of uh, our listeners and people who aren't down in making the sausage, they believe that the EP is always forgotten, um, that that Charleston doesn't think about them. Can you speak to about the the respect and the – 
the respect you have for the folks from the EP down there who are putting in, I think, you know, they're spending all 60 days down there. They're spending a lot of time traveling. Um, I feel respected down there, but can, can you speak to about what you think of the folks from the EP that, that spend so much time down there? Well, I, I guess let's start with the question of being forgotten. So yeah. I'm just going to quickly run down from memory here. The House Majority Leader is from the Eastern Panhandle. Yes. The, the Vice Chairman of Finance is from the Eastern Panhandle. The House Speaker Pro Tem is from the Eastern Panhandle. The House Chair on Economic Development and Tourism is from the Eastern Panhandle. I, I can keep going. Yeah. So, so let, I'll, I'll, I'll push back really hard no, on no. the forgotten piece. Yeah. But, but I also want to say that as a guy who lives 30 miles from the Capitol and who goes home every night during the regular session and sleeps in my own bed and sees my family every night, I have extraordinary respect for everybody from the Eastern Panhandle, the Northern Panhandle, even from McDowell County in Southern West Virginia, who are elected to the legislature and are willing to serve and do what it takes to fill those roles. Because it, it would be an impossibility for me, given given the current state of my family and my my job structure to be able to make that kind of sacrifice but everybody who's elected from here makes it and right. makes it 60 days a year and three other days a month every month and that's extraordinary and the public i hope appreciates the level of dedication that people who represent the eastern panhandle have to creating a better community here because it is an extraordinary sacrifice well, I think the other part, too, I mean, you, you talked about respect, and there is significant <clears throat> respect, I think, yeah. from across the state. I mean, people recognize that this is a growing area. The challenges in the EP are different than southern West Virginia. And, you know, we held an interim out here two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so when people actually got to come out, who may be from the coal fields, have never been out here, I think it gave them a lot of appreciation. One, like Roger said, how far it is and the commitment that the, the Eastern Panhandle uh, delegates have to serving their state and to serving their region so they're not you're not forgotten that's right and I, I think we're just so much different than the rest i know i went down to southern west virginia and i, I couldn't believe uh, i really got an understanding of okay we have different problems up here but there are plenty of other counties that have major problems that we need to deal with as a body that's what travel is important yeah. mike and i tell all of our members who want to go visit a different part of west virginia to absolutely embrace the chance to go do it so in in the course of my my day job my regular job i travel the state a lot i mean my my law firm has an office here in martinsburg right. i'll be there later today in fact i'm, I'm here with some frequency and i i see all the, the portions of West Virginia with regularity. So does, so does Clay. Clay works in an environment where he has multiple offices, sees all the parts of West Virginia. Not everyone has that luxury. Not everyone has that opportunity. Our, our state ranks 41st in size geographically among the among the 50 states, but it's, it's really, really diverse to be that small. It McDowell is. County and Jefferson County are two different are plans. quite different. Yeah. Uh, the differences are stark, and I, I spent plenty of time <laughs> in both. But unless you've spent plenty of time in both, you, you perhaps don't appreciate the magnitude of the challenges that both face for completely different reasons. Roger Hanshaw, Speaker of the House, Clay Riley, and uh, Clay is the caucus chairman. We take our break here, and then we'll welcome in the Senate President, Craig Blair, Senator Jason Barrett as well. And uh, if you're just tuning in, a little bit of a different Tuesday format today, kind of adopting the Friday show for the Tuesday. And uh, in studio, Mike Hornby co-hosting with me. Michael. Good morning, Rob. Good to see you again. And uh, holding over from the first half hour, if you missed it, Speaker of the House Roger Hanshaw and uh, Caucus Chairman Clay Riley. They both drove in special for the show today and to do some other business as well. Gentlemen, welcome back. Yes, sir. Glad to be here. Great to have you. And uh, in studio, <clears throat> now usually when I bring this guy on, i got to clear out a lot of stuff. Yeah. i got to create a lot of space. And you got to buckle up. <laughs> Senate President Craig Blair is in the house. Good morning, Craig. Good morning. I'm at the head of the table for all the listeners. I don't know why that is. Mr. Speaker, Clay, welcome to the Eastern Panhandle. I just want you to know that Mike's trying to make money off of you today. So <laughs> he normally pays his guest about 150 bucks to be here. So we need to make sure that he does that. I don't think any guess has ever been paid. <laughs> <laughs> Stubble feeling guilt strap and listening right now. Going, they owe me. <laughs> they owe me a lot. I didn't say any of what I said that was true, but it, it was fun watching your face. <laughs> and uh, via telephone, the only man that can make Bill Stubblefield angry quick, Jason Barrett. Good morning, Senator. 
Well, good morning, and um, it, it's an art to do that, but I enjoy doing it. So you got quite the panel, pan, quite the panel in there this morning. So good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Barrett. Um, shocking, you switched up and went to phone. Well, You've been you know, able to do it, that. it is funny. It is funny to me that the only one of us with a face for TV is on the phone, but, but that's okay. <laughs> he has to do it every time, doesn't he? <laughs> it's why he got Bill Stubblefield angry with him right, right away, right? So normally what we do on a Friday is uh, somebody tosses out a subject and we go around the table and discuss that uh, particular subject. And we always begin with Joe Ferretti via telephone on uh, Friday. So Jason, I will extend the same courtesy to you and begin with you on the telephone as to uh, what your subject matter will be. But before we get to that, I, I want to uh, also introduce the, you know, everybody knows about Baby Dog and the mural and all that controversy right well we didn't we didn't have to pay a lot of money for this picture but we do have it and we're going to put it on the screen right now <laughs> roger hanshaw's dog what's the name of your dog Roger? <laughs> his name is jethro and what, jethro. what did jethro do to wind up in prison he's outside this is this is this is last weekend we were barbecuing hamburgers on my back deck and jethro wanted inside <laughs> did, did, did he get some hamburger he at does least? he okay. always gets a hamburger <laughs> <laughs> jethro looks like he wants more than just some hamburger he always gets a hamburger <laughs> he, he wants a couple of them i think hey, that dog looks like raj come on buddy i've been here for you he he gets well, his hamburger raj has got Two really cute little girls, and I think that dogs look at them going, "I know I'm going to get some burger <laughs> through this." He does. <laughs> he does. Somebody's got to drop a little red meat over here. Come on. Well, no, good job, so Jethro. He, he likes it medium well. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of dog is Jethro? Jethro is a rescue from the Rome County Animal Shelter. Very nice. So he he has some Rottweiler in him. Um, uh huh. It's a good looking dog. How long have you had him? about 14 years oh that's good for him yeah very nice so, so he's not sad there he's just old well look <laughs> when you first look at the picture it looks like he's in a prison cell like what do you no. what do you do is he loitering no he's waiting to get on my back deck to get a hamburger <laughs> <laughs> that's great uh jason you're up first uh, with uh, issue number one tackle it well i'm not sh i'm not sure how i'm going to follow jethro but i'm going to do my best <laughs> um I i'm going to provide that my question is around the revenue estimates and the process by which uh, those are set and so just to give a little bit of background to the audience um each year the governor brings forward to the legislature um his proposed budget uh where the legislature has the ability uh, to, to alter the bu budget as, as it relates to spending uh, however, the revenue estimates are, are set totally at the discretion of the governor. So uh, my question to the panelists uh, is, should the legislature have any role in, 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 in with discretion uh, as it relates to those revenue estimates? Uh, and if so, if you believe that, um, what would that, uh, how would you implement that and what would that process look like? And uh, Jason, you were on finance back in the days when you were in the House and uh, Senate President Blair, formerly the Senate Finance Chairman as well. So we do have some inside finance information here. So Mike, let's start with you first here after Jason's question. Well, I think, you know, if the revenue estimates have been accurate, uh, I think we keep going the way we have. I know that we've had... Uh, the, the actual revenue has been higher, um, but I I, th I think giving the governor the that ability it, it, it's fine with me. I don't have uh, a lot of experience in, in how the governor comes up with his estimates, but to me it seems like you know the governor is the we have a very strong governor position in in West Virginia. And it seems like that's the the House and the, and the Senate get to decide what the, the the spending is. So. I have no problem with the, the governor All choosing right. that. That was totally right. milk toast, wishy washy. Yep. Let's get some back uh, bone and some spine in this, Craig Blair. What do you got for me on this one? Well, it's a little bit complicated on that. I like the fact that the governor sets the revenue estimates, but it can it works either way uh, on this. And uh, this governor uh, has worked with the legislature, uh, and when we started doing the flatline budget, he actually kept his revenue estimates flat. Okay, and in the past, though, and we could go through a decade where they spent up to the revenue estimates. 
And that's a problem. And uh, normal growth is by 3% a year. So what they would do is just increase the revenue estimates 3%. And it could get you in trouble. Uh, for instance, on severance tax. Uh, if you had a really good year the previous year on severance tax and they put the, sever or, uh, the revenue estimates for that, for that number and then the bottom drops out, which it does, then you're having mid-year cuts. And we went through that cycle over and over and over. But if, you know, we got a new governor coming in. And I would recommend to that new governor to keep your revenue estimates flat like this governor has and then work with the legislature like this governor has to be able to work the, the, the numbers. If you don't spend everything up front, then it gives you plenty of opportunity on the backside of the budget, whether it's in the surplus or the excess revenues, to be able to target spend where you need to, target save also, and target tax reduce. Clay? Yeah, so um, I think one of the reasons, and, and, and I would stay with the governor setting the estimate, but I, I, for a little bit different reason, we're a part-time legislature. If we were a full-time legislature, which I do not think we should be, it would be a little bit different because you'd, you'd have the time to go through the revenue hearings with each of the agencies. And when we're in session for 60 days and you're coming down for three days during an interim, I don't think you can dedicate the time, which is why the executive branch has Department of Revenue. They have a full-time staff. I think that it would become very challenging to do it in a, in a correct manner, mm -hmm. being a part-time legislature. And I just, so that's why I would support it that way. Mr. Speaker. So I could get there. I think the senators posed an interesting question here, and that is who who actually has or should have the the final say on how the state spends and what the state spends. And that that my view on that will always be that that should be the legislature. But let's talk about the mechanics of it. So first, to make that happen and to, to bring it into reality, we would have to amend the Constitution, which which is not a trivial step. I mean, we, we, we've We've tried that before. That's that's a that's an uphill climb any time we try to amend the Constitution. But we could do it. But second of all, if we did it, it would it would immediately put more pressure on the legislature to hold the line on spending. So one of the benefits, at least at least from my perspective, and I'd, I'd invite the president to tell me if I'm wrong about this because he was a finance chairman. One of the benefits, it seems to me, of the governor's revenue estimate of the governor setting the revenue estimate is it's an automatic check on on spending growth. So we we the legislature can't get ourselves into a deficit situation by artificially inflating our own revenue estimate and then ending up short on the back end. That's accurate. Is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate. Jason, comes back to you. Well, I, I think very interesting points made, and, and I don't uh, really tend to disagree. Uh, I think that it's um, the way that Governor Justice has set revenue estimates, uh, to Senator Blair's point, uh, is is that has really benefited the state as we move forward with trying to make tax cuts, with having these surpluses, to be able to spend the money um, at the end of the year when we know we have it. Um, but I, I have been there, and I know um, a few others uh, around the table have, were, were there at the same time when uh, we didn't have surpluses, and and the governor was uh, you know set rest, revenue estimates really high. Uh, and then what happens is, however much money that you allocate to the legislature, it is very hard for them to pull back. So uh, I understand the point that was made that, um, that, that the speaker made that the legislature would then have some of the responsibility of, of keeping us in check. So I think as long as you have a governor that has has done the process the way this governor has and not the way ones have in the past, I think it's okay the way that it is. Uh, but I think that eventually we will have a time where uh, the legislature and the governor have uh, very strong disagreements on what the revenue estimates are. Uh, and, and at that point, you know, there, there may need to be uh, that may need to be addressed and looked at in a different manner. Chris Chernock on our Facebook page posed the uh, possible uh, solution of having a full time he says technocratic committee to help with the estimates. Is that not what the revenue secretary uh, does? In the executive, yes. In, in the executive branch that's actually that that's 100 percent what they do so the secretary of tax and revenue at, at this moment in the person of larry pack has a has a staff that that is charged exclusively with that it's led mm -hmm. by a gentleman named mark muco right who's well respected as i understand he is yes. even by members of our body we we have 
substantially fewer staff and 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 don't don't produce our own estimate for that reason mm -hmm. yeah and i want to add one more thing to this and that is is that the, this governor has worked very very well with the house and the senate uh when it comes to that as we move into the session our meetings become more and more frequent with each other and now sometimes we get surprised by things and then and that's the governor's of prerogative to be able to do that uh, but to a greater degree it is not that way we can actually be able to determine what's going on I actually predict that because of the flatline budget how we've been managing the budget and everything that the new governor that we've seen a new norm take place now in the state of West Virginia because we've seen the dividends that came from it whereas before when they spent up to the revenue estimates and if the governor wanted to spend more money that year then they put the revenue estimates up higher and it was difficult for the legislature to say no to it uh, and so those dynamics have changed and I believe they changed long term uh, for, from that standpoint we'll see because we'll get ready to go through a transition here with a new governor so do you think the uh, the actual agencies have changed the way they are, are estimating it or, or? Uh, that's the most beautiful part about the flatline budget of uh, and that is is that you're able to squeeze the agencies and then just like when we bro broke up the DHHR and Department of Human Services in the last special session we actually created a bucket of money I think it was 183 million where this cabinet secretary can sign off and move money over to there but when they do there's a paper trail there's a paper trail and we can actually see what was going on and that was a problem with the Department of Health and Human Resources over there before that, that they were shifting money around the legislature had no idea and the legislature has the power of the purse and to, for the longest time we were blinded of by that and, and I'm, I'm not talking about the last eight years I'm talking about the last 50 years in this state was Part of the flatline budget uh, also born out of the frustration of many of the agencies having such large balances that you were having trouble getting access to and trying to bring that money back into general revenue? Yes, and keep in mind, though, to, to a greater degree, I'm the one that came up with this idea with Eric Nelson being uh, the House Finance Chairman. I talked him into doing this, talked the governor into doing it, and nobody believed it would actually bear fruit, but it has borne the fruit. And there is a... We could spend a whole hour on talking about the different things that take place and how money can be hidden. And But to boil it down in a simple turn is the spend it or lose it mentality. We see that at the federal government level, but all government agencies have that problem. They are always worried that if they do not use up their entire budget, then the following year that it will get reduced because they had excess revenues. And you shouldn't punish that. You should actually reward it, but that's not the mechanics of the behaviors that take place with it. How would you reward it? How would you reward it? How would you reward an agency that doesn't spend to the full budget? Because I'm going to guess that many of them don't because you've got a lot of unfilled positions, as I understand it. Correct? Oh, they use that as a shell game. That, that was a shell game in itself to being able to manipulate dollars around. And you, you thought that they had X amount of employees and actually had 20% less employees than they were using the payroll to be able to fund other programs that they wanted to fund that the legislature may or may not have wanted to have in action. And I sat in on finance this last session, almost every session. And that's a question Clay would ask is how many, uh, how many positions do you have that you haven't hired um, and how many empty FTEs how, do you have yes. and what's the revenue and, and that would be a employees. standard question for almost every agency that, that, that they, they ask for. Yeah, Rob, I want to jump in on that. and do, we, we, we have this conversation among ourselves from time to time about how we ought to budget and how we ought to fund the various agencies of government. And I mean, I, so I am a former state employee. I used to work for the State Department of Agriculture. Right out of college, my very first job back in West Virginia was working for then Commissioner Gus Douglas in the Department of Agriculture. And I, I, I defend state employees and, and state agencies sometimes, well, all, all the time. And, and I'm, I'm going to right now for just a moment because I want to be sure we're, we're 
given the right perspective to the listeners today. We, if, if you're not careful what you can leave a conversation like this thinking is that, that the legislature is under the impression that state employees are being wasteful and that state employees don't try to be responsible stewards of, of, of tax dollars. And I don't think that's what we're saying here at all. What we're saying is that this process sometimes forces us as the policymakers to say, are we, are we telling the government to do too much? And are we telling or have we created too many programs? Have we created some unnecessary responsibility on the part of agencies that really we don't need the agencies to do? So I, I used to be and am still a great fan of former Governor Mitch Daniels in Indiana. Uh, Governor Daniels was, was President Bush's OMB chief, then went on to be governor of Indiana, governor of the state of Indiana, and then president of Purdue University. And Governor Daniels in his inaugural address said, if we can find it in the phone book, then the state of Indiana shouldn't be doing it. If we can find it in the phone book, then the state of Indiana shouldn't do it. And that that sort of sh- that that view sort of shapes my perspective on well, what what things do we as the legislature need to compel agencies to do, and what things are actually more properly done in the private sector? And as we think about how we keep our budget down and how we how we keep in check the growth of spending, one way to do that is to is to look carefully every year at well what are we telling the agencies to do and are we telling them to do things that really the private sector would happily do if 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 left if we allow them sure if we allow them to do it and 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 could they do it better well but we're coming off of where we inherited 83 years of one party rule and their idea the the democrat party's idea over that time period for economic development was to grow government and so it dovetails in with what the speaker's saying here, and we're moving a lot of things into the private sector when need be uh, f- from that standpoint. But it used to be that, oh, my golly, our government was way too large for our population size that we have in this state. And then that's a component of it as well. And But when you squeeze them and you know that you've only got X amount of dollars to be able to spend, it makes you look for the efficiencies. That's what we do all the time. And the legislature is going in trying to find those efficiencies and be able to get it done. The governor's office has done Ann Erling, God bless her, uh, that she is really good at being able to go in and look for the efficiencies and where things are at. We all we're, that that is a new mindset that you can actually see with the agencies. That when I was in the minority, I could tell you right now that that didn't happen. A very good friend of mine, Rob, is a is a former. He's a retiree. He's retiree now, but he was a former senior administrator of one of our state's larger agencies. And he used to joke that all West Virginians should be thankful we aren't getting all the government we're paying for. (laughs) (laughs) Jason, what was your experience as a finance committee member when you were in the House in regards to some of the things that we've discussed just in the last five minutes? Well, I think that. As I spent more time on the finance committee, and I spent um, four or five years in the House on finance and, and one in the Senate, um, is it, it's you know you learn so much, and and it, it's very helpful to have people that are that are uh, have some financial background that that are quote unquote numbers people to be there. But it, it, even those kind of folks, it still takes a it, it's people that come from the private sector to go into sitting on the finance committee and trying to understand the way the government works. Um, it, it, it takes a little while to, ma- to wrap your mind around uh, the way government works as opposed to the way you would do it in the private um, sector. But, um, you know, I, I was there in, in tough times, and, and, and obviously I'm there now where, where we have these surpluses. And, and you know, to, to Mike's point about the question Clay asked, and, and that's something that we've been doing a long time, asking about these FTEs, because, um, you know, when I was first on the finance committee, one of the things that it, it took me a little bit to understand is, okay, an agency may have 200 positions, but they're only, uh, uh, they've only filled 150 of them. However, the legislature appropriates enough money for all 200 employees, knowing that um, there's no way they're going to be able to fill all 40 of those positions that are, that are vacant. Um, and I'm not sure that a lot of the agencies that, that I found as my tenure on finance was that agencies aren't really making a huge, in some cases, the, the agencies aren't making a huge effort to fill those positions or, or some of those are such skilled positions that it is very hard to find the people to be able to do it. So I get the impression, uh, or I got the impression on finance in some cases where, um, 
it, it was almost like you had to pry some information out of some uh, agency heads um, because it's a 60-day session. Uh, a lot of times I, I got the feeling that some of them are just trying to run that 60-day clock out um, and, and hoping that the legislature doesn't always uh, uncover, or the finance committee doesn't always uncover kind of what some of their motive is. And and, and I'm, I'm not here to speak um, poorly of, of agencies or agencies. Yes, I think a lot of them right now are, are doing great work, uh, but there are always those that that um, I walk into the committee room somewhat skeptical. And, and so that's just uh, maybe that's a cynical way to look at it, but uh, that's what my experience tells me to do. But Jason, doesn't aren't we? Isn't the private sector actually competing with some of these high higher end uh, agency jobs, like the accountants and the auditors and things like that? Aren't, oh, absolutely. I mean, we, oh, absolutely. the private sector is paying uh, so much more that it, it's hard to hire in those certain positions. Well, and I'll, and I'll give you an example that that um, in some of the non uniform staff in corrections, uh, some of those jobs pay twenty nine thousand dollars a year and require a bachelor's degree. And that's just not a position that's going to be easy to fill. And so, you know, there's an instance where I think we need to come in in the session and, and really, you know, we've done a, a, some pay raises for the uniformed officers that were absolutely necessary that's helped get us to a point now where we have less than 300 vacancies of correction officers as opposed to the 1,076 that we had a couple of years ago. But I think we have to take a look at uh, those non-uniformed officers because, uh, there is no way, whether it's in the Eastern Panhandle or anywhere in the state, where you're going to um, try to attract a, a, an employee, and certainly you won't be able to retain an employee that has a bachelor's degree starting them out at $29,000 a year. And, and Jason, we've got the complete opposite end of that bell curve in some of our positions, too. For As you just said, some of these jobs are very specialized. For, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll talk again about my time with the Department of Agriculture. To have a, a USDA certified diagnostic laboratory for agriculture purposes in West Virginia, the animal disease diagnostic portion of that laboratory, when I was there, used to require a veterinary pathologist to lead the laboratory. That's a person with a DVM PhD, two, two doctor, that, that's a person with two doctorates. And we, America, produce a double digit number of those people a year. The country produces a few dozen of those people a year. So to think that we're going to get that person for the $90,000 salary that we used to offer is frankly absurd. Uh, the, the pharmaceutical companies would pay them four multiples of that coming out of graduate school. So it's a, it's a complicated process on both ends of the bell curve. Bring this back now to uh, revenue estimates and your initial position, Jason. 30 seconds. Sum it up. Well, I, I thought I did, and, but but I'm happy to do that again. Um, oh, no need to you if you know, think look, you I, already wrapped it up. You're good. Okay. All right. Yeah. I don't want to make you work overtime. <laughs> Thank you. That's I appreciate it. I'm not getting paid any extra. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we didn't invite Jason into the studio because we didn't want to be disappointed by him not bringing in any of his biscuits from right. Tudors. That's right. By the way. Yeah. It's uh, 9 o'clock, or we'll be in uh, 30 seconds, and when we come back, Mike Hornby, you're on the clock. Uh-oh. All right, you're next up. You'll uh, note, looking around the room, it's a different Tuesday group here. Mike Hornby co-hosting with me today and making the drive up in Clay County. Speaker of the House, Roger Hanshaw. Roger, welcome back. Thanks for making the, the trip today. Good morning. From Harrison County, the House Caucus Chair, Clay Riley. Delegate, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. Glad to be here. Thanks for making the drive. Yeah. Senate President Craig Blair, who did not have to drive too far. In fact, he walked. <laughs> he came in the Mustang. Talk to him. Oh, yeah? yeah. Camara. 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 Sorry. Oh, you got to get your muscle cars right. <laughs> I just that's saw a white right. car. You I, took the hat off. Jackie Long was wondering if you were having a bad hair day, and that's why you were wearing the hat earlier. Every day's a bad hair day <laughs> for me. Uh, <laughs> or good. So, no, it was warm in here. Somebody needs to get the air conditioning taken care of. <laughs> that's householder's job. <laughs> Eric, he, Eric was at my place on Sunday, by the way, fixing a little leak. Is that right? Yeah, he was there for a few hours. And uh, it's, it always uh, cracks me up that you got the House Majority Leader, Eric. And there he was in his little footy socks and shorts and T-shirt working on my AC unit. <laughs> yeah, that, he does that's good pretty work. cool, right? He Citiz a, citizen the, legislature. He that that, is, that is our legislature. That is our legislature. You can, you can, you can find us. We, we go back home when the legislature's adjourned, and we live under the same laws that, that everybody else lives under. We work the same jobs everybody else works. We do the same things that every other West Virginian does. I'm, all, I'm proud of that. I actually yeah, like that. Yeah, it's very cool. Legislature. Say it. All walks of life. Yes. Yeah. And that's important to being able to do good legislation. Especially in the House. 
Yeah, a hundred of us all do different things. When uh, when Eric was installing, and by the way, I have to welcome back Jason <laughs> Barrett <laughs> too. Say, yeah. Jason, JB, Tudor's yeah, I'm still here. I, I just, I'm just curious. Is there a picture? I can't see the screen because I'm on the phone. But is there a picture of Householder in that outfit you talked about on the screen? <laughs> <laughs> I went to take a photo of him, and he snapped that phone right out of my hands. I bet he did. He didn't, but he's a good guy. Uh, and he does great work, too, by the way. So uh, with issue number two, leading off the second hour here, Delegate Michael Horn. Yeah, and kind of along those lines, uh, we're all people. We all have regular jobs. We're part of our community. Uh, my question to the panel as more experienced legislators, I'm asking your feedback. The one thing I struggle with is the email trolls from across the state but in some cases within my own district. I try to answer my own constituents as much as I can, uh, but some people don't like the answers we give or they don't like what we're doing or the direction we're taking. How do you respond or decide which ones to ignore and how much do you push back when needed? All right, let's start first with uh, Speaker Roger Hanshaw. Okay, sure, Rob, I'll, I'll take that one. So Mike, to, 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 I always start, and I tell every member of the House to start with, with remembering that we, all of us, represent a district, and we all represent a constituency. And those 18,000 West Virginians are the people whose voices we need to hear first. So for me, my priority rubric, if you will, for who I interact with and how I respond to inquiries begins with who are my constituents. So I always start there. I start with have have my constituents actually reached out to me on this question, and and that's that's I, th there's there's no higher there's no higher ranking in my communication queue than people who call my office or send an email or even send a letter. We get an awful lot of letters, by the way, from from my actual house district. So if you are if you are a resident of House District 62, you are at the top of my communication queue. So after that comes citizens of West Virginia. And if you are a West Virginian from any of the other 99 districts, to the extent I'm able, I want to I want to hear your feedback and answer your communication too. Realize that a lot of times, though, some of that communication is is manufactured, and I think that's what you're you're driving at here. We we have a lot of folks who, for right or wrong, lend their voice to the causes of others. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a very particular example of that. We had an issue before the body in one of my early years as a legislator. The, the advocacy organizations on, on the, the, the really one side of that issue had, had effectively shut down the state email system with, with just really abusive email tactics. And they had done so by, by effect, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna go ahead and use the word hijacking the email addresses of their members of their members and they were using their members email addresses to to bombard the email servers and the email system for the state legislature i recognized one of those names as as really a, a longtime friend of mine from from my district and i knew he hadn't seen that email i knew good and well he hadn't seen that email so i actually printed it off and 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 took it to him. I, I see that I see the gentleman from time to time. He doesn't live too far from me. So I took it to him. I said, I'm going to withhold his name here. I said, just wanted you to know I got your email today. And he looked at that email and he was aghast. His 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 mouth flew open. His his eyes got wide. And he said, I've never seen this before. Furthermore, I don't even agree with this. It was it was the advocacy organization of which he was a member that was using his email address to allegedly communicate on his behalf with us. So, so it, 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 you do have to exercise some discretion here. So after, after the geographic uh, priority, if you will, I go to, has someone actually asked me a question or is someone just wanting to convey his or her position? So, so my constituents who are asking a question, I do, I do make a real priority of trying to answer the question. Not, not always to respond if they're just simply giving me their input on an issue. And I almost will never argue with, with a, a person who writes in uh, because odds are, I have more information on the issue. I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to have more information. All four of us are supposed to have by virtue of the jobs we've taken here that the people have given us. We are, we are supposed to spend more time collecting information. We're given more information with which to make decisions. 
sometimes that puts us in a fundamentally different position than many of the folks who want to call in with really some some vitriolic uh, communication and I, I i almost never respond to any of that clay yeah i think uh, roger said it I, I take a similar approach and i don't know if it's from just watching as the house uh, as i've been there but when it's my constituent i mean all 18,000 of them, I take a priority in responding back to them. Even in some of the advocacy groups that if they come in and, and you know, there's one right now that consistently sends for clean water um, for a PSD that is no longer even viable. It's not there. But if it's someone within my district, I make sure at least to respond, especially if they have a question. Um, so I, I take the same approach. What if they don't like your answer? Well, if they don't like my answer, I, I kind of live by the truth is truth. Right. And, and as Roger said, we, we have more information a lot of the times. So, and sometimes my response is, hey, I, I appreciate your insight. Good to hear from you. Thank you. And, and they just don't like the response. But I think it's important to be able to respond to them because that's what we are there. I mean, we are public servants. We're there to, to, to serve. I also take a pretty uh, strong priority in returning phone calls and answering phones. That's actually my favorite thing to do, and I was talking to Rob about that earlier. It's my favorite thing to do in the legislature is to sit in my office and answer my phone because when you actually get someone, if they've made the effort and they really have creative ideas, you tend to win friends even if they disagree with you because you're able to have a conversation, you're able to listen, you're able to have that personal one-on-one -on -one contact. So that's kind of the approach that I take. We're looking for somebody out front, Clay. If you want some part-time work, talk to Mike on the way out the door today. <laughs> well, you were talking about what he pays earlier, so I'm good. No? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Blair. That's pretty good. That, that position's been vacant for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> that's my wife's position. <laughs> well, she but, chooses when to come in. <laughs> <laughs> she works for the right price. Yeah. The, the speaker hit the nail to, on to explaining all this. I want to hit a couple here. Bulk mass emails. Uh, we get a lot of those, and what I do, you read one, and then you can actually tell in the subject line that it's the same thing. So at that point in time, you start counting, uh, and you see how many of them are coming in. It gives you an idea. And I say counting. You can visually look at it and say there was 50 of them, there was 100, there was 1,000. Sometimes the emails actually scroll in front of you. Uh, because somebody coming in, that's especially oh. during the 60-day session. Yeah. And that's but by design sometimes because the more they can gum your email up, then the more they can slow you down from being able to do the good work for the people of West Virginia. Now, one of my favorite emails are the ones that write me and have good ideas. And those will get responses back and action. Okay, that, that, that is fun when you see somebody that, that sends you something that you say, oh, my golly, why not think of that? Uh, what and then you deploy and, and see where you can't do it and that that creates an email dialogue that works very very well uh, the next one is where somebody's having a problem and when you run across those emails it's a problem where somebody's been done wrong in the government of uh, whatever it may be then you, you try to facilitate those as quickly as possible I've had those before where I've received one like 1130 at night and uh, we were able to solve the problem by 2 o'clock in the morning uh, by everybody working together. That actually does happen, and I'm telling you, that's the most rewarding part of being a legislator is being able to help somebody that's in crisis and need to be able to solve those problems. They don't happen a lot, but it does come across. Uh, the, the next one is the habitual complainers. Uh, they're coming through. That's where you look, you read, uh, and then in my case, most of the time, I don't engage uh, because it's a no-win situation. You're not going to win anything on this. And then i got to add another one to the list, and that is, is the group uh, that what they saw on Fox News last night or the news in general because it's both sides of the spectrum, and they're wanting to tell you all about what you should do in Washington, D.C., Okay, and I hate to tell you, but I don't work in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's a state legislature, and so you sort of chuckle about that, and the next morning somebody else has probably gotten the same thing that you serve with, and you're having coffee or whatever, and you're talking about, did you get that email last night? Uh, and, but the other thing is, is that I always advertise myself in. 
and to a greater degree, people would text me and call my cell phone. And I'm like Clay. When somebody would call my cell, even if I was in a meeting, uh, if I didn't answer that call right then, I called that number back. And lots of times you were able to really, really help the people out. That's probably one of the most rewarding things of being a legislator. Jason Barrett via telephone. Jason, two minutes. Sure. Well, I think that, that the way that Roger outlined uh, the way in which um, – you know, he handles uh, communication with constituents, I think is the way that the vast majority of us do it. Um, but to Craig's point about the phone calls, and that, that's what I, I prefer to talk to people either in person or on the phone as opposed to email, especially uh, as Mike talked about the folks that um, you that are, are argumentative or or at least disagreeing with, with my position. And uh, I think it's, the way that I operate is if, if someone sends me an email, I'll, I'll certainly respond. Um, and if, you know, it comes back and, and we have a difference of opinion or they're argumentative or disagreeing, if their phone number's in the email, I'm going to pick the phone up and call them because I think they can understand tone. They can understand that, that I'm um, appreciative of their opinion um, and, and to explain my position. And I think it's just moving forward to have, uh, you know, a relationship with that person as their elected official. I think it's far better to pick the phone up and call them. If they didn't provide their phone number and the email, I'll give them my cell phone and ask them to call me. Um, and I think it's it's always important for legislators to understand, especially those that are new, is that when you took the oath to do to, to serve the people of your district, you didn't just do that for the people that voted for you, the people that like you. And you know there have been a lot of times where people may have criticized me during a campaign maybe said nasty things about me on a Facebook post. And after the election's over and we're in session, they'll pick up the phone and call me or email me and ask me for my help. I don't let them know that I know what they said about me. I try to help them any way I can because that's what the job is. And um, and, and I, I take that opportunity to prove that what they said about me or what they think about um, you know, my ability or, or uh, my motives as a legislator is inaccurate, and I get more personal satisfaction out of doing that uh, than anything. And so I think it's just, um, you know, just put yourself in their position and say, hey, look, because a lot of times they have may have an issue to the tax office. Uh, you know, I get people because I serve as the chair of uh, the committee on regional jails and um, correction authority, but I get calls from people that have uh, relatives uh, that are their inmates that you know, may not like their uh, accommodations, and, uh, you know, I pass those along to, to, to corrections. And, you know, you get calls that, that people are just frustrated with something in state government. They don't know who to turn to. Uh, they've, you know, tried to call whatever agency they think is appropriate. They, they maybe feel like they've gotten the runaround. And so sometimes, you know, we are the fourth or fifth, eighth or tenth person that they've called, and they're frustrated. And I think it's our obligation to try to do anything you can um, you know, to, to solve whatever issue they are, at least get them in contact with the right people that can help them. And I think that that's a big part of the job that often the public is, or the public overlooks because, you know, it's just not what the media covers for obvious reasons, and it's just not something that that, or, that the everyday person thinks about that, that we do. But it is a big part of the job that we do. Jason, thank you. Mike, final word is yours. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with uh, Craig. It, it is truly rewarding when you get to actually help somebody. And I think it. When I first got down there, it was almost impossible because obviously you don't you don't know anybody, you don't know any of the department heads, you don't know. And I think as you get more experience and you, you rise through the ranks and you get to meet people, I think you can do those things a lot easier too. Issue number three, Senate President Craig Blair. All righty. Well, let's talk about uh, the potential new governor coming in and uh, then the cabinet appointments. But whether it's the cabinet secretaries, that were, were, are they going to keep any of them? Or are they going to move them? And I think it's an opportunity for us to showcase a little bit on some of the good cabinet secretaries that's out there uh, currently right now. And then agenda items. What do we think that are going to be the new things or that uh, are moving forward for the state of West Virginia? I'm assuming all of you will be shy to talk about personnel because you don't want to disrupt any of the apple cart or negotiations that are going on behind the scenes. Not me. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> you're a free agent, baby. You can just stir it up if I'm you want to. I'm already advocating. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's start first uh, with uh, – uh, let's go to Clay first. We haven't let off with Clay in a while. Go ahead. Yeah, so give me that one, Rob. I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> Thank you, Senator President. Senator President. You're welcome. You know, I do think that 
uh, this governor has surrounded himself with some pretty good secretaries who have who've, who've really made an impact. And, and I think you've seen that. I'm, I'm not going to use names, but I think when you look back over the past couple years, the legislature uh, has, I don't want to say rewarded those divisions, but those divisions and those departments who've provided a return on the investment, you have seen them continuously increase, whether it's budgets, whether it's focus on what we can do to grow those things. So I think that they'll end up keeping uh, part of them. Obviously, some of them, like Larry Pack, who is going to, you know, is running for treasurer and hopefully will win that. Um, you know, they, they, it's going to he's, he's unopposed, right? He's unopposed. Yeah, okay. I just want to make sure <laughs> okay. you want to see if you're catching. Hopefully, I, that was the hopefully yeah, yeah. win. I got you. Um, but they're definitely going to have to replace, you know, him. Um, and some others that I think that are just moving on. So I think that's what you're going to see. And every governor, I'm sure, wants his people around him to make sure he has the people that he trusts and the information. What do you think is uh, whoever the next governor is? We presume it's Patrick Morrissey in West Virginia where there's such Republican dominance. But uh, regardless, what do you think the main agenda items would be? You know, I think uh, they will be looking for smaller government. I think one of the things that Patrick is uh, – Tenor General Morsi has, has said in his campaign that he wants to make government more efficient. He wants to make sure that he expands some of the school choice. I think those will be some of his agenda items as he moves forward. Michael? So, I, I mean, I think the cabinet secretary, the tourism is fantastic. She's a brilliant talent. Uh, if she doesn't move on by herself, I, I would be hard pressed to say that you know, somebody else could do a better job. Um, I think, you know, like Randall Reed Smith, that, that man, he, he moves the whole um, body when he speaks. He's very good at his job. I'd, I'd hate to see him go. Um, I'd love to see somebody like uh, Eric Householder maybe go into that Larry Pack position. I, you know, let, Eric's been in the legislation for a while. He, nobody knows that uh, budget or that finance more than he does i think he'd do an adequate job well you're in the senate too so uh, i just gotta give gotta give the house some love here craig um but yeah i, I, I agree with clay i think uh patrick will make a, a thing for downsizing government i think education choice will be um something that he focuses on um uh, we'll see and again we're presuming uh patrick uh, yeah, would win the yeah, election I am, as Republican. i am presumed i am presuming yeah. that i mean I, that would have to, it would take something monumental for him to to lose in my opinion and that's just my humble opinion jb um you know I, there are a lot of cabinet secretaries uh, that i think do an outstanding job um I, certainly um, governor morrissey is going to and i'm going to make that assumption too because i know how to count uh i'm the, the governor morrissey is going to want people around him that he can trust and i, I appreciate that and, and if i was the governor elect that's exactly uh, what I would want to do. Uh, I think, um, to Mike's point about uh, Chelsea Ruby as the Secretary of Tourism, I don't think there's a better secretary in the state of West Virginia uh, who does, she just does an outstanding job with promoting West Virginia. Uh, I've been to uh, um, uh, out of town on some trips here recently, and um, I was in Pittsburgh recently, went to a, a Pirates game, and in the seventh inning stretch, all the screens light up with West Virginia tourism. And so I think they've done a, a tremendous job. There are a couple of folks that aren't cabinet level positions that I, uh, and I'll mention their names because I think they do a great job. Um, with uh, my work as it relates to uh, the regional jails and, and uh, prisons uh, is Billy Marshall, who is the new um, commissioner of uh, Division of Corrections and Rehab, has really been a rock star coming into a job. Coming, he came into a job that has been um, really difficult. There were some lawsuits. Some of them had merit. Uh, and Billy's really done a nice job of turning that around. He, he's great to communicate with. Uh, if I ever have an issue with a constituent or, or something that, that the committee has a question about, he is on top of it right away. Those are the type of people that, that I would suggest that to um, the next governor that, that they surround themselves with. Certainly Fred Bluton at the ABC. There's been a lot of ABC changes that were made uh, across the, uh, or in, in Charleston, and a lot of them are around issues facing the Eastern Panhandle. We, you know, there's a, a lot of wineries uh, and breweries uh, just as you cross the border into to Virginia, and that tourism market, uh, you know, in West Virginia should be better than it is. And you know, we've done some things to really help them out. Uh, this past session, Commissioner Wooten was really helpful with getting some of those changes uh, in ABC law that, that really help um, those facilities uh, here in West Virginia. Uh, I fully expect um, 
uh, the governor to really want to right size government. I know that's what everybody says, but that's what that's what Patrick Morrissey has been advocating for. His tenure as as, uh, uh, as attorney general with taking on overreach from the federal government. I expect uh, more of the same. But one name that I'd like to throw out for a potential revenue secretary or or uh, certainly a high level position within the governor's administration is is someone that that uh, has been around a long time that knows the budget process, knows the numbers, uh, and it may come back to the conversation that we started with about setting the revenue estimates, uh, having the legislature do that, I think is to have uh, a, a legislator who um, certainly knows all as aspects of state government, uh, and that's someone on the panel today in Craig Blair. And that, that silence from Mr. Blair. And thank you. Do I get a free Tudor biscuit too? <laughs> <laughs> Roger Hanshaw. Yeah, I, I, so I want to. I want to jump in on what the president said about agenda items. So, you know, one of the th if, if we stick with the assumption that, it, that it's General Morrissey, one of the things, and I've not had this conversation with him, Rob, but one of the things that he has done extraordinarily well on on our behalf, not and not just on our behalf either, but on behalf of states writ large, is assert the proper role of state governments with respect to federalism issues. There are, there are things that states are supposed to do in this country, and there are things that Congress is not supposed to do. And General Morrissey's done a good job of pointing out some of those, those uh, discrepancies, I'll say, and, and taking them all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States and been successful. And, and I, I think, I, at least I hope, we'll see even more of that from his position litigating on behalf of the state of West Virginia as the governor, not not just as the AG here, because we're, we're in a time when a lot of problems that states would like to solve, we're prohibited from solving by federal preemption. So Congress, Congress doesn't act on a particular issue, but yet when states try to act on it, the executive branch agencies in Congress raise their hands and say preemption, preemption, preemption. I think particularly about an issue related to Internet connectivity. I, I think about a, a, a particular statute that we passed in West Virginia that related to pole attachment for broadband fiber. And the, the, the Federal Communications Commission was doing nothing. Congress was doing nothing to solve the problem. So we took a step toward trying to solve it ourselves. And within days, within days, we, we faced a federal lawsuit asserting federal preemption on that issue. And we were enjoined. The federal courts enjoined enforcement of our statute and, and to, with no action by the FCC or Congress, just simply the, the, the regular assertion of federal preemption that that's that's an that's an improper use of our structure and general morrissey understands that roger thank you craig 30 seconds to wrap it up literally 30. okay i think the panel has done a good job of explaining that to, uh when it comes to the cabinet secretaries we've got some great cabinet secretaries out there and actually i think governor morrissey would actually move forward with that when it comes to being governor though i think you're going to see like the speaker was saying he's going to use his expertise of what he has right now like the opioids like government reforms and managing that then he's going to build off of it for education education, jobs, infrastructures, all those things. And that is where he chooses the right people for the job and those cabinet secretaries, and he'll be able to deploy it all. And on that note, we take our break. Clay Riley, you're on the clock next. A special Tuesday show with, uh, via telephone, Senator Jason Barrett. JB, welcome back. Always great to be with you. Delayed response. Thought we lost him for a second. The mogul, Delegate Michael Hornby. Good morning, Rob. Speaker of the House, Roger Hanshaw. Yes, sir. Made the drive in from Clay County. Senate President Craig Blair. Good to see you, sir. Good morning. And the man who <laughs> author issue number four, the guy who drove in from Harrison County this morning, Delegate Clay Riley. Good morning, Rob. Great to be in person. Good to have you. Now, sir, your issue. Yeah, so... You know, being a public servant, there's something that always inspires you. There's a reason why you finally make that decision to put your name on the ballot. So we all came in to the legislature at different times, different issues. I'd like to hear, you know, what was that issue that finally convinced you to put your name on the ballot? Were you able to get it done? What have you learned in this process? Because we're pretty wide-eyed as freshmen when we come in. So. All right. What made you run for office? So let me start with uh, the telephone and Jason Barrett, because I remember your races against uh, Walter Duke. You guys were like Frazier and Ali and Superfight 1, 2, and 3. Jason, what made you decide to finally enter the ring? 
We were like Frazier and Ali, but unfortunately I was Frazier. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I don't know that there was one, one particular issue that, said, that made me decide I wanted to do it. I've spent a lot of time with my, at my grandparents when I was very young, and uh, they were always interested in politics, and I think that's just where my interest came in politics and public service. So, but there, there was an issue that, um, you know, when I was first elected that, that I wanted to race down and, and try to fix, and uh, I'm still racing down trying to fix, and that is uh, the locality pay issue. And, um, you know, it's one that um, takes a lot of education and understanding from uh, members in other parts of the state. and. You know, we've made uh, some progress in doing that. Um, two years uh, two years ago, uh, we were able to pass a bill out of my first year in the Senate. We were able to pass out a bill that um, just called on every state agency to develop a locality pay system uh, for their agency and bring that back to the legislature uh, for us to, to look at implementing and funding. And, and it made it out of the Senate 33 to nothing. It went to the House, passed out of uh, House finance in a somewhat close uh, margin and certainly uh, a fair amount of, of opposition um, uh, in the House finance. And uh, passed out of the committee, went to the floor. But, you know, I don't think the votes were there. There had been a, a previous fight in that session uh, over a different locality pay bill. Uh, and it really became this territorial north versus south. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I think the bill very likely would have died on the floor, and I think leadership in the House made the right decision at that time to, to park that um, on the inactive calendar. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's one that's uh, it's a, it's an issue that still frustrates me and uh, that I'm still working diligently on, and I hope that, um, you know, we can move forward with something that, um, um, you know, will provide um, some locality pay for area, growing areas of the state and areas where the market rate uh, for um, competition in the private sector um, really um, indicates that we need to pay our public employees in those specific areas a little bit more. So. All right, thank you, JB. Michael. Well, I, you know, I've been friends with Jason for a long time, and he was my delegate. So when he decided to run for the Senate, that spot became open. And I was very interested in. Um, We'd had a lot of really good economic development within the Eastern Panhandle, Procter & Gamble, Macy's. I mean, you, you name it, you guys all know. Um, and I was really wanting to do something to promote small businesses coming to to, to, to West Virginia. And I, I really thought I could go down there and get it done. But yet, it, it's been... Uh, it's been a lot harder than I thought, and it, it's something that I still want to. I want to promote. We just haven't found the right vehicle or bill to do that. Um, speaking of that bill that Jason was talking about, the locality pay, we were about eleven votes. We'd voted, I think, two days before Jason put that one through, and we parked that. But we were about eleven votes short of locality pay. And I, I back then, I thought there was no chance that we could get locality pay. However, I sit here today, and I see a very positive future. Uh, moving forward, and, and I think a number of our legislators from the Eastern Panhandle, Northern Panhandle, are really trying to develop relationships within the House. And I think a lot of people just have to understand that the, the relationships are important. It is important to, to understand what's going on in all parts of the state. And eventually, I think we'll get locality pay done. Speaker Henshaw. You want to talk about locality pay or my issue? Your issue. <laughs> okay. So, so I, I never felt some lifelong calling to run for public office. That was that was not some some childhood aspiration I ever had. I I went to graduate school after I finished my undergraduate degree at WVU to study chemistry, with the full and complete expectation of coming back to the Canal Valley and working at the Dow what we call the tech center in Charleston. It was it was the research and development facility that Union Carbide had created and maintained just on the hill in South Charleston. It overlooks the it overlooks the Canal Valley. After Union Carbide sold it out, it went to, it went to Dow. It was it's, it was an extraordinary place. Billions of dollars worth of intellectual property had been developed there over time and and some of the, the the finest research scientists in the world worked there. Members of the National Academy of Science were on the were on the staff of that R and D facility. And I went to school to come back and work there. I, I wanted a job doing chemical research at that tech center. And in my third year of graduate school, that 
tech center closed and all those jobs went to Midland, Michigan. So I still came home. I, my family's been in the, the Canal Valley since the late 1800s. I'm sorry, since the late 18th century, since the late 1700s. So I, I was always going to come home, and I came home anyway and had to take a very different career trajectory because of that, because of that issue. So the job that I had prepared for, had gone to school for, literally disappeared in one day. And I was I was had to take had to take a completely different career trajectory, and I'm I'm not unhappy that I did, but it did change fundamentally and forever my thinking on what our state's economy means to people, what it means to families. Because when I finished graduate school, the job that I'd prepared for was gone, and the opportunities that I had were in Philadelphia, Chicago, and Los Angeles. So when I finished school, I was offered three very good jobs in Chicago, Philly, or L.A. I didn't want to move to Chicago, Philly, or L.A. I wanted to move back to the Canal Valley. So I did that and, and, and wound up taking a very different course in life. But as, as a consequence of doing that, I, I did begin to just feel some deep calling to, to, if I've chosen this as my home, if I've actually decided this is going to be where I live, I, I have some obligation to try to make it better. And at, at the time, I was, I was represented by a gentleman who was not responsive to my requests and my ideas and my inquiries. I was one of those people sending those emails that we were talking about earlier in the segment today and got, got no response and no reaction. So I decided I'd take matters into my own hands. What made you run for speaker, to put your name in for speaker? Or did you get asked? To well, I, I, I was at the, the first time I was asked. Okay. Mr. Blair. Well, I love this question. This is my favorite question. The reason for it is, is that I was, I'm a small business owner, was a small business owner. And back in 2000, 2001, uh, workers' comp was sucking the life out of my business. In fact, I had the same amount of employees as what we have today. Uh, I, I'm figuring that the employees are making 100% more today than what they were then. Our state budget at that point in time was $2.6 billion. Workers' comp was $4.2 billion in debt. $4.2 billion in debt. And it was a train wreck waiting to help happen. And so we were the worst in the nation, 50th. And by the way, my bill for workers' comp that year was $9,998, $2 less than $10,000. You fast forward to last year, my son owns the business now, it was $1,500 and some odd dollars. Okay, we went from the worst into the nation to at one point in time where you were the best, we're number two right now. Do you think for a minute that Procter & Gamble would be here, that Clorox would be here, that Nucor would be here, that Commercial Metals would be here if you did not fix workers' comp? How long did it take you, Craig, from the time you got elected to getting that piece of legislation passed? Well, the, 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 to Joe Manchin, in his ultimate wisdom, co-opted it. And when he became governor, he actually forced the Democrats, he burnt political capital to make this happen. Speaker knows what I'm talking about on this. He made it happen, and then I'm sitting there, uh, to, but him and I had many conversations on this, and we created Brick Street at the time. Greg Burton was Bob Wise's chief of staff at the time when we were fighting for this also. Uh, to be able to get it done. And they created a company now that services, I think, in COVA uh, is servicing the whole United States, and they've got casualty and all other things. This is a West Virginia-based company that we grew out of the state of West Virginia out of necessity. So but I give Joe Manchin a lot of credit for it. But I went down there, and I talked to everybody. And whenever I'd talk to send emails or talk to politicians about it, they glaze over. They had no idea what I was talking about. But if that, between fixing the pension system, and, and that's been a gradual, but it started in 1992, workers' comp was another pivotal point, and then you move all the way, basically, to the Republicans taking over. That's the growth that you've seen in the state of West Virginia for us to be heading in the right direction. Clay, comes back to you. Yeah, so I'm kind of like Roger. I didn't have any intention of ever running for office. It was never on my radar. It was never anything that I wanted to do. But in my career, uh, you know, I've done infrastructure across the whole mid-Atlantic in eight states. And I always just kind of complained to my dad about, you know, why do, I don't understand why we do it this hard. Like, why, why are we falling behind with these over-regulations and regulatory reform and micromanagement? Finally, it was after he'd had his heart attack, he said, boy, either shut up or do something about it. And I'd 
And I said, what? And he said, shut up or do something about it. And so I decided at that point I was going to put my name on the ballot. And one of the things, and, and so my thing was I wanted to improve the infrastructure in the state of West Virginia because I do think it's important for a quality of life. It's important for businesses to be able to locate here. It's important for my kids to be able to stay here and live here long term. And so that's where my focus has been. I wanted to bring my expertise from, from years around the country and, and bring it back to help improve the state of West Virginia. Thank you, Clay. Good one. And with uh, issue number five, the Anchor Leg, Speaker Roger Hanshaw. Sure, I'll go, Rob. So it looks like we've got about 13 more minutes left here. So last Monday. 11 minus the commercial break. Okay. <laughs> last Monday, the governor was in Weirton and had an announcement about the, 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 the decision by Cleveland Cliffs to enter an entirely new line of business here in West Virginia and save those those 900 jobs in Weirton, in the northern panhandle. And that's just extraordinary. And I've, I've been thinking about that over the course of the past past week or so. You know, we have come a very long way in the past 10 years. We, we, have, we have taken ourselves off the judicial hellhole list, which we had been on every year since it was created. We have seen $13 billion. The last number I saw was $13 billion worth of announced investment in economic development projects in West Virginia over the course of the past five years. We have made our way finally onto some of the lists of the best states for doing business. Rob, you cited this morning that we we're, we've made our way onto the list of one of the best states in which to retire. We, we, have, we have started the flywheel turning in creating a new economy here in West Virginia. I, I, want to, I want us to wrap the segment up this morning by talking about what it, what it takes to keep that going. How do, we keep the, how do we keep the message about that moving and what are, what are the things we have to either keep doing or make sure we don't slip back into? Senator Jason Barrett, you go first. Sure. Well, and, and you know, certainly kudos to the governor, and, and, and I know Craig and Roger and so many others have uh, been part of, of helping um, continue Cleveland Cliffs uh, in West Virginia, uh, certainly a, a big issue uh, in the northern panhandle where we've had so many successes in bringing so many jobs in, and here we were the threat of losing those, and uh, so, so kudos to the governor and everybody involved for helping with that. But the infrastructure um, investment uh, and, and attracting these companies has to continue. The, the way the speaker just mentioned is that uh, we can't rest on our laurels. We've had a lot of successes, but we have to continue to move forward. And you move forward by continuing that investment. And tax cuts are incredibly important to the state of West Virginia, uh, but it's a balancing act between giving tax cuts and then also investing in our state's future. And, and I think investing in the infrastructure to continue uh, to bring these companies uh, to West Virginia that employ a lot of people that creates a, by doing that creates an environment where our existing small businesses in our state uh, can flourish and do better. And so, you know, I think it's just continuing uh, those investments in infrastructure. Good answer. Michael Hornby. Um, I, well, I agree with everything they're saying. I think also we should not forget education and invest, investing in our education system. I think the school aid formula is something we need to adjust the testing. There's something between that. Um, moving forward, uh, I'd like to see a, a comprehensive look at the education system. And uh, of course, Amendment 4, I was always for that. So I'd like to see that come back. Nothing drives up property values like a good school. Yep. Craig Blair. D -d -d my perspective is is that we need to continue to the destination that we've had in place. And every year that's went by since the Republicans have taken over, we've gotten better and better and better at what we do. Okay, so you got to stay focused on where we're at. Jobs. Jobs is what creates the tax base that you need to be able to do everything else. And you, when you're taking raw materials and turning them into a sellable product that somebody wants to buy, that's where your true profit comes from. And when you do that, then education, the infrastructures, the broadband, all the resources that it takes to be able to have a society, it, it comes from that. And then you're able to keep your youth here. Our number one export in my entire lifetime has been our children in the state of West Virginia because they had to go elsewhere to find gainful employment. We've changed that dynamic in the state of West Virginia, and we're still in our infancy. And so we got to make sure that we keep our eye on the ball. Hungry. Stay hungry for success. And we, will, and we just got done having a conference. And I can remember going to these conferences, and nobody even cared about West Virginia. Didn't even know who West Virginia. They thought that we were part of Virginia. 
Not anymore. These people realize that West Virginia is on the map. We're here to play the game. We're here to play the game and win. That is the focus that needs to stay, and our people need to have that same hunger and that belief that we're not toothless and barefooted, that we are quite capable of competing anywhere, not just in this country, but in the world. Clay Riley. Yeah, I agree with the Senate President. I think we have to stay disciplined doing the things that we have been doing. We've been enacting policies to prevent government overreach, to be more efficient in government, make good investments in education, make sure that we're bringing the jobs here, that we're looking forward to that 21st century economy, whether it's the cybersecurity, advanced manufacturing. We have real strengths within our state that are naturally here. Continuing to accentuate, accentuate those strengths, whether it's the oil and natural gas or coal or whatever the energy source, we need to make sure we stay disciplined keep doing the things we're going to be doing or we've been doing so that we can get to the end goal and i think that's most important Raj comes back to you unless you got something michael well i was just going to say what, what about the future for aeronautics within um, within oh. west virginia isn't that a very bright future that we have uh, something different the aviation aviation yeah. so back in 2017 there was a study called west virginia forward and in that study aviation was one of the top industries that we could you know, highlight and accentuate where we were really strong. You've seen the investment by Precision Cast Parts and Time Met and the Berkshire Hathaway down in Jackson County. I think you've seen additional contracts come to Constellium. You're seeing uh, increased improvements in the aerospace from whether it's the AMP school in Pierpont or the Bill No Flight School down at Marshall. You and those are great paying jobs. Those correct? are great. They came off. They come off. They literally walk across the runway from school. After 18 months, and they're making 70, 80, 90 thousand dollar jobs, and they can't get enough. Mm -hmm. They can't get enough employees. 100 percent so, placement rate. 100 percent. That's unbelievable. Yeah. The, the Pierpont School already has 130 employee or 130 students for next year. They already have job offers. And we invested in. And we, we did. And we invested in it. And so investing in those <clears throat> places where we're getting the return on the investment for the people to get jobs to become gainfully employed. That's exactly what we need to do. You know, we're, we're still a state with challenges. We're still a state with a lot of problems. We're still a state with, with great needs. But I have I've said since the first day I set foot in the legislature that the best social welfare program we can create is a good job opportunity. If we can, if we can give people, if we, we give, give men and women an opportunity to actually take home more money, they can make better life choices, they can access better health care, they can, they can provide better educational opportunities for their children. All of the, all of the social ills that we spend so much time trying to solve are, are solvable by people as long as we've given them the resources to do it. And, and I will continue to, stay, or to say that the best social welfare program our legislature can create is a good job program. Speaking of taking home more money in your check, the governor would like to add 5% on top of that 4% trigger that took place. Jason Barrett, I'll go around the table. You get uh, 15, 20 seconds apiece. Jason Barrett, can we do a 9% income tax cut? Well, we can do it. Um, but, you know, as Roger said in the beginning, it's about priorities. And, you know, I think there are a few big ticket items out there. Um, that we need to address that will help uh, free up some money to be able to, to afford additional tax cuts. And so, you know, but at the same time, we have put in a, a bill a couple of years ago uh, that has triggers and, and, a, and a complete formula that reduces a personal income tax when the triggers are met. And so, you know, I think sticking, there's, there's some benefit to sticking with the plan, um, but, but, you know, I'm, I'm always eager and willing, you know, to give additional tax cuts tax cuts, but it is a balancing act of being able to invest uh, in the state's future at the same time. That was way longer than 15 seconds. Michael Hornby. I'm going to go Hi. with uh, Vice Chair Vern Chris. I had a great conversation with him at the last conference. I believe our leadership can get this done. I think we're going to get uh, a 9% tax cut. Craig Blair. <laughs> well, I'm t we can do it, but you're going to have to take other liabilities off the table into the future. And otherwise, if you do not take these other liabilities off the table into the future, what you're going to do is create a point in time on where we failed. We failed, and that, that point in time will actually destroy all the work that we've done at this point in time. Clay Riley. So it's going to go down to poor 
4.9.1.5.2, I think, with the cuts. I think we are going to have to reduce some liabilities and some expenses if we want to get there any further. Speaker Hanshaw. It's always possible. That it's always possible. We, we, can, we can deploy resources in any number of ways. It's just a question of what our priorities are. And I, don't, I, I haven't seen the governor's proposal yet with enough specificity to know what he's recommending. All right, final minute coming up next. Gentlemen, you'll get eight seconds apiece to say <laughs> goodbye. Anything you want in those eight seconds right after we do this two-minute break. Mr. Barrett, we start with you on the phone. Final thoughts, eight seconds, go. Uh, the, the state has been successful. Uh, the legislature has been successful in proving our state, largely because the legislature is full of people like uh, the four people you have sitting around the panel today. Roger Hanshaw, you're down to five seconds. Go. Yeah, it's good. always good to be back in the Eastern Panhandle in person, see, and see uh, wh what's going on in a place that we don't visit enough. Clay Riley, five seconds. Glad to be in the EP. Can't wait to come back. Mr. Thanks, Blair. Welcome to the Eastern Panhandle. Mr. Speaker, it's been a pleasure to work with you over the last four years. Mr. Hornby. And I want to thank all of you for coming in today. I appreciate it and making the drive. That goes double for me. The Dave Ramsey Show is next. This is Talk Radio, WR Martinsburg and TV 10. We'll talk to you again in 22 short hours. TV 10, we'll talk to you again in 22 short hours.